die. And with these lessons coming from Scripture, we see the design in Jesus coming and living on this earth, not just coming to die, but coming to live, to teach us how to live, to show us even submission to the Father, as he did while he was here, and those various things that, that we've had time to look at together. But also then, even last week, being born to die, that he came for the purpose of sacrifice, to give himself. And looking at those passages that deal with that, and there, there could have been so many more that we could have gone to, and hopefully some of you have looked at a few of those even this week. But the idea of the design of Jesus coming, living, and then dying. But this morning, I want us to look at born to live again. Born to live again. You know, it's, it's easy when we, you know, we can, we can see something like this and, and see a baby in a manger. Uh, little Penelope is here with us this morning, and we're all excited to see her. Uh, and I get to put a plug in. We got a new grandson a couple of evenings ago. Uh, you know, that's, that's exciting. It's exciting times to experience things like that. But Jesus didn't come to remain a baby, and we've looked at that. He didn't come uh, just to be what we would consider just the, the preciousness of a tiny child. But there, it was surrounded with purpose on what he came to do. Last week we read in Isaiah chapter 53. And part of it, as I read, I read through and didn't really go back and focus on it. But it's toward the end of that, and I want us to turn there again. Isaiah chapter 53 is that passage that describes Jesus, the Messiah, the one who was coming, in such a way that we see the agony, we see the suffering, we see the picture of a man of sorrow, as it describes this one who will offer himself, who will go to the cross, without a word, without raising up against them his entourage that he could have called. In verse 10, we kind of looked last week in this chapter, and we read, I think, all of it, but that the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. But then, he kind of on with this idea that what he was doing, God the Father was pleased to do in him. But following up with that, then he says he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and good pleasure, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge of the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquity. And it says, therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sins of many, and he interceded for the transgressors. You see a continuation. You see a sacrifice, and you would, our minds go, if we try to picture sacrifice in the realm that we are introduced to Jesus, where it's under the law, and animals are sacrificed for sin. They're sacrificed for other things as well. Sin was always marginal. Let me say that again. Sin was not always marginal, but sin was always marginal as far as covering all of the sacrifices with an animal. Sin was center stage with the sin offering and the guilt offering, the trespass offering. But even those burn offerings, sin was still marginal even though that was worship to God. And it was representative of the end of a life that sin demands death. The wages of sin is death, is what Paul tells the Roman Christians. It's what death has earned, or sin has earned. It's death. And we see somewhat of a finality In Psalm 16, if you want to turn there with me, the psalmist, King David, he wrote a lot of songs, and many of them had to do uh, with things that were going to come about, some of them simply the things that he had experienced, the things that he had gone through, the feelings that he had toward God, even toward himself, in some occasions, uh, penitent songs. 
But in Psalm 16, beginning in verse 7, it says, I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, by my instruction in the night, I have set the Lord continually before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither wilt thou allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Thou wilt make known to me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy right hand there are pleasures forever. He makes a statement within this psalm, and of course, the people of Israel singing this probably had no idea of the indication that they were singing when they would sing, For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Sheol or to the grave, nor allow thy holy one to undergo decay. Because Peter in Acts chapter 2, and if you want to glance over there in Acts chapter 2, because what he's preaching about is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2, this is what can be known as the first gospel sermon uh, to some degree. It's when the church began. And Peter makes mention of what David
Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which, this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and prophets spoke of it. We see it in Isaiah 53. We've seen it back here in Psalm chapter 16 or the 16th Psalm. And it is what declares Jesus to be the Son of God even today. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul in his letter to the Romans says exactly that. When he says in verse 4, who was declared, let me start verse 3, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus was raised. He is declared with power. Not just declared. He was declared when he was born that he was the Son of God, was he not? And even following that up, I mean, you, you see in the temple uh, the, the things that happen there, Simeon and Anna and the things that, that take place in the temple. He was declared when he came, even by the angel, that he was the Son of God. But he was declared with power to be the Son of God by the resurrection. There is no dispute. Even today, there is no dispute when you look at the evidences surrounding the resurrection of the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the facts are there. I'm not going to go into all those, but simply to say that those who were against Christ, those who were against what he taught, those who were against those who followed him, his disciples, they were called Christians first in Antioch, a little bit later on. They could have stopped it dead in his tracks. All they had to do was produce a body to say it's secure. But they couldn't. Jesus, the Son of God. He was born to live again. Jesus says in John chapter 16, beginning in verse 16, a little while and you will no longer see me. He's talking to his disciples. And again a little while and you will see me. Some of the disciples then said to one another, What is this thing he is telling us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father? So they were, at, they were saying, What is this he says? A little while. We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them, Are you deliberating together about this, that I said a little while and you will not see me? And again, a little while and, and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born to the world. Therefore, you too have grief now. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take joy away from you. Nobody can take away what we have today. For Jesus lived again. Born again. That sounds the same, doesn't it? Born to live again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, in order
it's interesting when we when we think of birth and we think of a new birth, we're we're very familiar these days with the term born again. Right? We hear it, we hear Christians and non Christians use the term born again, referring to Christians. And it's kind of redundant when somebody says born again Christian. How can you not be born again if you're a Christian? A Christian is a disciple of Christ. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, we see that in Acts. Those disciples were called Christians. And it continued on. A disciple is a learner and a follower of him. But when we think about birth and death, because we know that it's as much as we are born, and at last we come looking at the aspect that, that we don't ask to be born and we don't ask to die in general. Uh, but when we compare those two, you know, when you go back to the Garden of Eden and they sinned, what did God say would happen if they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? What would happen? They would die. When? When did he say they would die? Well, you guys know this. In the Day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Satan said, no, the serpent. So they ate. Did they die that day? Not physically, did they? They died spiritually. There is spiritual death. It's separation from God. They experienced the separation. the fellowship that he had with them. They did die that day. As a consequence, and that's the punishment. That was the punishment for sin, and it still is. We just mentioned a little bit earlier, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. I haven't finished that verse yet. I just referred to it twice. I haven't finished it yet, but it is. That is still the punishment for sin. And that was their punishment was death, separation from God. There was a consequence as well. The consequence was they were taken out of the Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden taken away from the tree of life, even as God said, lest they eat of it and become like one of us and live forever. And so there was a consequence that they were taken away from the tree of life, and so they died physically then as well. Just not that day. They had many more years to live, and they weren't near as easy as however many they lived before then. I don't know how many that was. <coughs> so now they didn't have that fellowship that they once had with God. And so when we when we kind of picture that there, that and we can does all that make sense? What I just said does it make sense? Spiritual death and physical death. Do we understand that to some degree? You know, spiritual things can become hard to grasp. But we should be able to grasp them if we're in Christ. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, who understands the spirit or the mind of Christ? So spiritual things. But he says, we are given the mind of Christ so that we do understand it. Now in chapter 3, he goes on into that and saying, you don't understand because you're still living like mere men. You're living naturally instead of spiritually. And so living So we can understand that, that idea of spiritual death, that separation from God. If you don't understand separation from God, think about your sin for just a moment. And then think about talking to God. That's separation. You feel it? Jesus, Jesus came for that purpose. To give us new hope. To give us new life. Now, if we understand spiritual death and physical death, let's compare that over to spiritual birth, being born again. Because in a sense, we do have the same thing. Jesus wasn't telling Nicodemus something that was going to be pie in the sky by and by, you know, that they was going to get into it later. He was telling him something for the here and the now. Titus, in chapter 3, calls it the watching of regeneration. Peter, in 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3, calls it the new birth. And it is what we experience when we refer back to passages like Galatians, chapter 3, verse 20, where I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Crucified, die. Nevertheless, live. Yet not I, not me, but Christ.
only in order to obtain what he has planned for us, even as we glanced at last week, what we cannot imagine that he has planned for those who love him. We must die. <coughs> and that's spiritually and physically. And so that doesn't make it such a bad thing, does it? Not that stone and weakness, but it's raised in power. So he says, now this I say, brethren, again, verse 15, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you then, priest, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised,
I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. God with us. God made flesh is the wonder of the Christian faith. The Apostle Paul spoke of our Lord and made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, even the death of on the cross. The purpose of his coming is revealed there when our Lord took upon himself the form of a He not only expressed the concern of God in his creation that he died for us, but in through his determined action and teaching, he portrayed the depravity of nature of man's lost position. Sin had come into the world in a vicious way, bringing death with it. No person is exempt from it, killing him. For this reason, our Lord did for us what we could never do for ourselves. Christ Jesus willingly died for us in order that we might live. This ministry of Christ Jesus is both well receptive and corrective. We are quite familiar in that he purchased us with his own blood. In addition, the Apostle Paul said, Let this mind be you in you, which was in Christ Jesus. When a person possesses the mind of Christ in humility and service, redemption will not only prove to be the blessing that it is, but the redeemer will be a new person capable of new accomplishments. All the failures will be known no more. Humility, not arrogance, is the mark of a faithful Christian. As we approach communion today, we want to do so in the spirit of, God, of humility and, and need. Let our worship be sincere and our hearts pure. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son into the world to die for us, and that through that death we would have the opportunity for eternal life. Realize, Father, that as we Take on the mind of Christ and become like him. We will do those things that are pleasing in your sight, and we'll be reaching out to those that are lost beside us. Help us to live faithfully in that love, and in that care, and in your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
But in the scheme of things, we would receive the larger gift than any of us could ever purchase. All we have has come from the hands of God who owns and has made everything. And in response, what can we do about that? In some ways, it's kind of like the prophet and someone say, what do you get for someone who has everything? In the Old Testament, God gave instructions to give a tithe of 10 